issues arising from COVID-19, particularly as they relate to migrant workers and labour migration systems around the world. Um, I'm going to skip some of my opening remarks and go straight to the housekeeping issues. This is really just in terms of how uh, the WebEx platform works. So uh, I'll introduce our speakers in a moment. We'll have all three presentations and then we have one uh, Q&A discussion, including because a lot of the presentations do uh, end up um, turning into a bit of a dialogue and we can have a very interesting Q&A. Please feel free to send your questions through the chat function, sorry, the Q&A function at any time. And there we'll be able to access uh, those. And if you could indicate who your question is for, whether that's a specific speaker or whether that's to all of uh, the panelists. Um, now I'll introduce the panelists. We'll have three presentations of around 15, 20 minutes each, and then we can go into the Q&A discussion. So the first panelist uh, this morning, or this afternoon or the evening, depending on where you are, is uh, Brenda Yao. Brenda is the Raffles Professor of Social Sciences at the National University of Singapore and Research Leader of the Asian Migration Cluster at the Asia Research Institute. She's, of course, one of the most experienced and widely published migration academics in Asia. And Brenda will be presenting her paper on temporary migration regimes and their sustainability in times of COVID-19. Then we'll hear from uh, Martin Roos, who is the Chair in Migration Studies and the Deputy Director of the Migration Policy Centre at the European University Institute in Florence. You will know that Professor Roos's research focuses on the economics and the politics of international migration with a strong international comparative dimension. Um, Martin today will be taking us through his co-authored paper on COVID-19 systemic resilience and migrant workers. And hopefully, time permitting, he'll also share with us some of the key takeaways from EUI's recent virtual conference on systemic resilience and migration. And we're also uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Marla Aziz join us, who is the Executive Director of the Scalabrini Migration Centre in Manila. She's a sociologist who's long been working on international migration and social change in Asia. And Dr. Aziz also edits the Asian and Pacific Migration Journal. Mal is joining us today to share with uh, to share with us. She's joining us today to share her analysis of the repatriation of Filipino migrants during the pandemic, uh, which stems from her recent paper on the topic in our migration research series. So, without further ado, and again, apologies for the delay. I will hand over now to Brenda, who will present her paper. Thanks, Brenda. Hello from Singapore. Uh, it's um approaching evening and um, I uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some thoughts on temporary migration regimes uh, in pandemic times. Uh, if you can all see the screen, uh, if I could proceed. I think it, it goes without saying that uh, in pre-COVID times uh, with in an era high mobility, temporary labour migration schemes has, has been expanding and increasingly prevalent sort of globally. And pathways to permanency has been narrowing. And we see that temporary migration has been growing quite fast, twice as fast year on year compared to those with permanent visas. And of course, uh, temporary migration is central to the migration and development discourse, uh, where mutual benefits for sending and receiving states are, uh, in a sense, secured through a managerial approach that ensures, on the one hand, the transients and non-integration of labour migrants in whole societies, and on the other hand, the durability of remittance transfers to left-behind families in home countries. So, in that sense, pre-COVID-19 assumptions are that this balancing act between the economic benefits and the social consequences of temporary migration can be held up uh, and managed in order to promote sort of development benefits for all. Uh, and this particular kind of uh, um, uh, pathway towards development is predicated on the ease of international travel and the constant churning of migrants across international borders. 
So, of course, the curtailment of perhaps national mobility during pandemic times basically came as a shock. And uh, this then provides an opportunity to question the sustainability of temporary migration in the COVID-19 aftermath, especially when back and forth mobility, just churning of migrants back and forth, is now difficult, impeded, costly and risky. So, uh, in the paper, basically, I discussed some short term policy measures that were put in place uh, in response to the pandemic, but also then uh, examine these short term fixes that were improvised during this time to see whether there are lessons for longer term sustainability uh, in the post COVID times. Of course, when post COVID times will arrive is anyone's guess. So I'll just very briefly run through the short term policy responses. These are, of course, uh, designed largely to meet urgent needs under exceptional circumstances and do not address structural issues that underpin temporary migration schemes. Um, we see as the COVID-19 pandemic spread, um, the, some host countries have integrated migrants into national plans for virus testing. And in some countries, including Singapore, uh, migrants have been, in a sense, prioritized for uh, virus testing um, in order to provide um, treatment and, and as a means of transmission control. So, and a second sort of uh, approach in some countries is to offer welfare support uh, selectively for migrant workers, uh, either in cash or in kind assistance to support stranded migrant workers. Um, and um, this is, uh, again, uh, not always uh, done by the state, but sometimes by uh, migrant NGOs. Um, thirdly, employment support for migrant workers has not really been forthcoming because um, essentially migration uh, employment protection goes against the economic rationale for having transient labor in the first place. And uh, they're usually at the bottom of the agenda for, for governments struggling with rocketing unemployment rates amongst the more vulnerable citizens. So this is, uh, but there are some some uh, extensions of uh, relaxing employment rules uh, regarding changing employers, for example, to to try to fill uh, labor migration labor market gaps. And finally, uh, we see, of course, that uh, whilst transnational mobility has, in a sense, uh, been impeded for most migrant workers, for selected migrant workers. There's been exceptions made in order to expedite the entry of uh, what's usually called essential workers, either for healthcare or for, for agricultural uh, purposes. So, but for most uh, transient migrant workers, transnational mobility is an illusion that's ridden with all kinds of difficulties and dangers. Uh, and in this era of low mobility, repatriation is slow, staggered and out of step with the magnitude of the issue, which I'm sure uh, Mala will elaborate more on. And migrants find themselves immobilized in insanitary detention camps whilst awaiting repatriation. So these are the sort of short-term fixes. And of course, um, these short-term fixes may or may not, in a sense, have a longer life to them. And beyond the current crisis, the uncertainties of the pandemic and persistence of depressed economic conditions may mean that there will be a reduction in demand for migrant workers and borders will increasingly be tightened. So um, on the there's been quite a bit of discussion about uh, whether this low mobility sort of regime will induce technological progress to fill labor shortages. But in many sectors, technological innovations are likely to completely automate away the need for migrant workers. So, but apart, apart from looking at technology, it, this is also an opportune moment to think about what needs to be changed uh, and for us to step forward to make those kinds of uh, changes that are needed, those changes that are overdue structural changes that will hopefully render migration regimes more sustainable. And it's to that that I would like to turn to. I have three points to make. The first has to do with longer stays and less churn. 
um, as we saw, the closing of borders at the height of the crisis put a stop to this very easy back and forth churning of migrant workers across borders. This is, of course, highly profitable for the migration brokerage industry. And um, this kind of um, situation has meant that nation states will have to cope with uh, stranded workers and in some cases you see the extension of work permits and contracts and also allowing migrant workers access to job matching. The post-COVID-19 context with a reduced volume of labour migration may be more conducive to offering these kinds of longer contracts of uh, and then in a sense uh, sort of less churning across the borders. It would be great if these can be coupled with skilled sort of uh, acquisition opportunities, uh, as well as clearer employer responsibility for home leave and repatriation. Longer stays, I think, makes sense because it um, for the worker, it, it, it does away with the uncertainty of contract termination. It obviates sorts of recurring brokerage fees, but it also for the industry and the nation state, it may improve labor productivity. So the idea here is that reduced mobility in these kinds of post pandemic times can mean less unproductive churning and more productive migrants and may even reduce the carbon footprint of, of, of this kind of um, budget flights across the borders. My second sort of um, foray in trying to come up with some kind of suggestion is to look at the kinds of um, welfare support that sprung up during times of COVID. Uh, of course, these were in a sense, um, sometimes knee-jerk reactions under exceptional circumstances and are very limited. But, uh, and of course, these are not targeted at migrant workers in their own right, but often to do with safeguarding national interest, including curbing the spread of the virus and meeting sort of important labor needs in key sectors of the economy. But as the pandemic shows, repatriating excess migrant workers, this use and discard kind of uh, framework, this kind of logic is no longer, uh, nation states are no longer able to perform that speedily and cheaply. Neither are they able to always contain and segregate migrant workers from whole society. So there is a window of opportunity to reframe transient labour, not only within the logics of use and discard, but also as an integral part of national labour supply to be safeguarded for more sustainable growth and development. So by incorporating migrant workers into national safety nets that provide health care and income protection, this is not just to do with a positive effect on migrant welfare, but uh, would be a means of future proving the economy against the crippling effects of other pandemics and other crises to come. And the third and last sort of issue that I wanted to bring up is um, integrating migrants as a safeguard against xenophobia. So this is a time of stalled mobility and we see that uh, migrants and particularly temporary migrants become easy targets for vilification and blame. This is, why is this so? This is often exacerbated by the fact that these migrants have very little social capital and uh, to claim a place in whole society and also because they're supposed to be temporary. So their visible presence, whether in the form of migrant enclaves, gathering grounds, hotspots and so forth, uh, uh, become an issue because they no longer can be quickly excised or easily segregated from whole society, as their su supposedly temporary status suggests. So to turn this around, I mean, uh, one way of uh, looking at this is to, to look for opportunities to build social ties and cohesion between migrants and citizens rather than to fall back on the current measures of separation and containment. By investing in social resilience, by building these ties of interdependence, reducing workplace inequalities, hierarchies, uh, racial stereotypes, and countering sort of racializing discourse with this active promotion of a sense of common humanity that did pop up um, in uh, many societies during, during times of COVID. Uh, 
um, and of course, looking for innovative design, urban designs, provision of com communal services and facilities that bring people together in order to avoid sharply disaggregated migrant communities may, may be the way to go in order to safeguard against xenophobia. And um, so to conclude, I think the main point I wanted to make is that the uh, COVID-19 has really undermined assumptions that um, back and forth mobility across international borders can be sustained at low cost. This constant churn of migrants is something that's uh, fundamental to the temporary migration scheme, and this is no longer sustainable. So there's a need to revisit the structural dimensions of temporary migration. So I'm not in a sense proposing an end to temporary migration, but a call to establish contract-based migration on more sustainable grounds. Uh, and um, for government policies uh, that can incentivize these kinds of desirable structural change, and I've discussed three forms, longer stays whilst investing in raising migrants' productivity. Uh, secondly, incorporating migrants into national safety nets to future proof against crisis. And thirdly, social integration to safeguard against xenophobia. So of course, this also requires uh, going beyond the nation state to think about international and regional cooperation amongst uh, sending and receiving states and um, perhaps thinking around the ideas of transnational labor citizenship that's um, characterized by the possibility of benefits and services and the enforcement of basement, baseline labor rights uh, would be something that we need to revisit. Um, and in the words of the United Nations, the crisis has forced us to confront this choice, go back to the world we knew before, or deal decisively with those issues that make us all unnecessarily vulnerable to this and future crisis. So, um, what I've hoped to, to have done in this short presentation is to show that we can build on the momentum of short-term policy responses that were developed in a time of crisis to move temporary migration regime to more sustainable and equitable basis in the longer term. That would be indeed uh, one of the decisive steps forwards. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks so much, Brenda. That was um, a, a wonderful introduction and a wonderful analysis um, in on this particular topic and drawing uh, on the acute kind of situation that we all saw play out in regards to the start of COVID and what it means for the longer term and especially around the aspect where we have created a system in so many different parts of the world where high mobility is embedded within migration systems. And that's a, like a, a key message. And it was a beautiful segue actually to Martin's um, presentation because you uh, very clearly introduced the, the topic of resilience and systemic re resilience within a lot of um, systems. Of course, I had a couple of questions. So I'm thinking along, especially in your body of work, uh, your reflections on, on gender and also the sectoral kind of aspect. But I know Martin will be certainly going into the sectoral aspects and we'll come back to you to get some reflections on the gender dimensions as well. So uh, now let's hand over to Martin. I will just mention too that I, I uh, misspoke. Um, I don't know which platform I thought I was on, but please uh, put your questions in the chat. I think the Q&A is not working for this uh, webinar as I've been advised by my team. Sorry about that. But if you can uh, put your questions in the chat and then we can get to those in the Q&A session. So thank you again, Brenda. And now I'll hand over to Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mari and IOM for inviting me to participate in this discussion today. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, so the the remarks I'm giving today are, are based on um, a short note that um, Bridget Anderson, Friedrich Peschel and I prepared for the IOM uh, a few months ago and that we have in the meanwhile reworked into a longer working paper. You can see the reference here. And in fact, we built a whole um, a project around it on, on migrants and systemic resilience. And as Mari mentioned, uh, I think the three talks today are very complementary um, in the sense that 
Um, I think we're all talking in one way or another about a window of opportunity uh, for doing things differently and better um, because of COVID and, and, and after COVID. And uh, Brenda spoke about uh, the need to change the way we think about temporary migration programs, make some policy changes. And what I want to talk about is the, the role that migrants could play in uh, promoting what we call systemic resilience. So what do we mean by that? That, well, since the outbreak of uh, the pandemic, we have heard a lot about the need to protect um, essential services, essential economic goods and services, such as health services, social care, food and agriculture, for example. And we've also heard, of course, that migrants often represent significant shares of the workforce in these um, sectors across countries. There are differences across countries in the shares of migrants, but generally migrants often play a big role. And we have had um, an apparent appreciation of, of, of the contributions that migrants uh, make. Um, you know, in Europe, for example, in the UK, we have had the clapping for essential workers, including migrants. And so I think that raises the question whether there is a moment now where systemic resilience or trying to protect these essential services becomes a new policy goal um, in migration policy making and broader policy making, and whether that provides an opportunity to rethink more generally how we think about the impacts of migration and how we design migration policies. So um, the starting point is, of course, that we have had uh, quite a lot of research and, and, and big debates about the roles that migrant workers can play in addressing labor and skills shortages. And I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Uh, and, you know, are migrants needed or not to fill shortages in certain sectors, in the health sector, in agriculture, in construction, and so on? But now I think there is this new question um, about the role that migrant workers can play in shaping the resilience of some of these essential services during COVID, but also, of course, uh, to potential similar future shocks. And we are, of course, quite sure that there will be uh, future shocks that we'll have to deal with. So um, thinking about systemic resilience, I think, is really unavoidable. So how does the employment of migrants affect the resilience of some of these, these uh, essential services, the provision of these essential goods and services? And how does that vary across different countries? And what can we learn um, from what's happening now also for, for future, future policies? And I think what that requires us to do, if we want to think about that question, is really to integrate the research and the debates that we've had on, on labor migration and shortages with the largely separate work that has been going on about systemic resilience. And that, and that work has been happening in other disciplines, uh, studying the environment or, or even engineering. So I think there are insights that we can take from some of these other fields and bring into the analysis of migration and migration policies. And really, the, I suppose the case I want to make is today that if we take systemic resilience seriously, as I think we should, um, then I think there is a case for rethinking uh, how we assess the impacts of migration and also re rethinking how we design migration and, and wider public policies. So briefly, uh, what do we know already? And this will be familiar to, 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 many, to many people. Um, so, so a key challenge, of course, of labor immigration policy making is to assess, to link labor immigration to the needs of the domestic labor market. And of course, these needs, uh, skills needs and labor needs tend to be quite contested. Um, and why is that? Well, because uh, there is no uh, universally accepted definition of, of skills. Typically, labor immigration policy systems make a difference between high skills and low skills. I have rarely met an employer who says that the workers are low skilled. There are different types of skills, credentialized hard skills or soft skills. 
the particular employer demands and preferences. So I think it can be quite hard to, to draw the line uh, between different skill levels. Similarly, there's no universal definition of shortages. So when an employer says there's a shortage, we need migrant workers to, uh, for the care sector. Um, of course, we have to ask a lot of questions of what causes that shortage. What's the role of wages and, and conditions? Is the short, does the shortage exist because wages are low and conditions are poor? And, you know, a simple, kind of a simple minded economist response would be, well, what about letting wages rise? Can wages rise and will that reduce shortages? The other point, of course, that we know from research and has been heavily discussed in many countries is that uh, what's the, you know, what's the optimal policy response to a shortage? Immigration is often one response. It's often a desirable response, but it might not be the only response. There might be other responses such as rising wages, such as mechanization or computerization, um, offshoring, training more domestic workers. I'm not suggesting that these alternatives exist in all sectors, but the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that just because there's a shortage doesn't mean there's an automatic immediate need for migrant workers. And we do know that some of these shortages arise because of the larger institutions and policies in a particular country that have nothing to do with immigration. So for example, a poor training system. If you have a poor training system in say the construction sector, then you're likely to develop shortages of suitably skilled construction workers. So in that case, the shortage has nothing to do with immigration in a sense, but the shortage is because of a failure of another policy, in this case, training policy. Or you, if you have housing policies that don't, don't enable domestic workers to live in certain areas, then you might have shortages of workers in those areas. So we call this kind of system effects. We know that. And the final point I want to briefly make about this on this review of what we know already is that, of course, um, if you want to address the question, is there a need for migrant workers? Should we have more or less of labor immigration? I mean, these are deeply political questions. In a way, there's no one, because there are alternative responses, we're weighing up different interests. Um, so whether it's better to let wages rise or to have immigration are often distributional issues. So it's, there's a politics of labor and skill shortages. So if we now bring into this kind of um, traditional um, way of thinking about things, the idea of resilience, what does that do? Well, I'll just be very brief on this, but resilience, what do we mean by resilience? Well, you have an economic system that is, or you have a um, socioeconomic system that experiences a shock. So the performance of that system will decline, however you measure it. But it's not only about the total impact, of course, we're not only concerned about that, but we're also concerned about the recovery time and the shape of the recovery. So the, the shaded area here in this chart will give you an idea. That's the area in a way that we're trying to, to minimize. How quickly are we getting back? How quickly are we recovering um, to the previous path? And again, I'm going to be very brief, but two, two features of flexible, of resilient systems are flexibility and what people often call social capital or, or networks. So what flexibility means uh, very simply is that there are ways of rearranging production, um, of doing things in a flexible way. So re you reduce the dependence on, on, the status, on the status quo. What social capital or networks mean is that if, if, you have a pro if you have processes that are very well networked, if, if one small part of the network doesn't perform, you might be able to replace the functions through other parts of the network. Networks also mean information sharing, um, having a common purpose and providing practical mutual support. So the question then is, how can migration and migrants contribute to resilient systems? Well, I think the question then becomes is, how do migrants relate to flexibility? And how do migrants relate to social capital or, or, or networks? Now, briefly, just if you think about this idea of systemic resilience as a policy goal, what might that mean? for not only the analysis of migration, but also for the regulation of labor migration policies. There's just four ideas here. I think one, one change that, that would need to happen is that we shift our attention from focusing on the role of migrants in specific occupations or sectors to transnational systems. Typically, when we talk about the need for migrant workers, 
we have very specific occupations in mind. So, you know, nurses, doctors, construction workers, IT workers, is in, the, in this particular occupation, occupation, is there a shortage? You know, why does the shortage exist? Is there a need for migrant workers? But I think when you, when you think about resilience, I think you have to think much more broadly. Why? Well, because uh, we're talking about systems that provide a particular service. Um, so, for example, if you have a food system that is fairly reliant on imports of particular foods and global food chains, it's no good just thinking about the role of migrants in producing food in a particular country. You need to think about migrants along the whole global supply chain. So it's not only about migrants in one country, it's migrants working along the supply chain across different countries. So I think there's an opportunity again to connect debates across different countries when you think about uh, resilience. The other point, I suppose this is a bit more speculative, is that if you think about resilience, it might become less important to be so focused on protecting the employment of citizens. We know that in a lot of labor immigration policies, what's really important, what's driving the debate is this, this political need to protect the employment of citizens. Of course, that will always be important. But when you think about resilience in a way, especially resilience to crisis, arguably the overarching uh, goal here is to make sure that the service is protected and that the essential service continues. So I think there's an opportunity to think about more broadly about how can that be achieved through all kinds of different workers, not only domestic workers. Now, there's an obvious need to think to move on from thinking from the short term to the longer term. Migration policy making is often driven by short term considerations about efficiency and distribution, who benefits, who loses in the short term, whereas resilience obviously requires us to think to think longer term. And if you take resilience seriously as a policy goal, I think um, we have to talk about the new politics of labor immigration. Again, I'm not suggesting that all these things will happen, but I do think there are opportunities now to rethink, for example, how we deal with what is typically known as lower skilled labor migration. We know politically this is often considered very difficult to open up to migration for for lower skilled employment. But again, in this crisis, we have shown with this renewed emphasis or with this new emphasis on resilience, a lot of migrants, a lot of uh, workers in so-called lower skilled jobs are absolutely critical to ensuring resilience. So does that open up an opportunity um, for reforming lower skilled labor immigration policies and thinking differently about the rights of migrant workers, not only in high skilled, but also in lower skilled, in lower skilled occupations? Uh, briefly, um, and I'll, I'll finish up with this. I think there's an important policy debate to be had. And, and I personally think that uh, because crises and shocks are going to be with us for some time, and there might be different future shocks, I think thinking about resilience is really important, in addition to the traditional concerns about efficiency and, and, and distribution. Now, whether or not that happens politically is, of course, a separate question. But I think that research can also try to contribute to, to highlighting the importance of this issue and to highlighting the links between the employment of migrants and the resilience of systems. And so here, here are three types of research I think that, that, that could be done and that kind of could be a new research agenda. I mean, one, one question is, how do migrants and citizens compare uh, in terms of their effects on resilience within given systems? So by that I mean within the current institutional structure, so within the current system, for example, of providing social care in a particular country, you know, what's the difference between migrants and citizens in terms of their flexibility and in terms of their, in terms of their networks? I think that is one interesting question what one could ask. But we should also compare the migrants' roles across different systems because there might be different responses to the question, how can you make the system more resilient with regard to migration? Again, one, one response is to say, well, we change our migration policies because, for example, we appreciate the role that migrants play in particular sectors. They need to be given more rights in order to make sure they can fully contribute to resilience. So you change your kind of um, labor mix, for example, or the rights of existing workers. But another response might be to say, well, we have to switch systems. You know, we have to, it's no good just thinking about how our workers in general are treated and about our migration policies, we need to think about the larger institutions. We think about how 
food production is organized, we think about how we protect global supply chains. So we can think about switching, for example, from a social care system that is reliant on minimum wage labor to one that is that has a more regulated labor market and pays workers better. And migrants, again, can play different roles across these different systems. And I think a third question that that's very important, particularly, I suppose, for political scientists as well, is to understand the choices and determinants of resilient strategies across different systems. Um, so we know that, again, I'll come back to the social care system. We know social care is organized very differently in the UK, in Sweden, in, 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 in different countries outside Europe. How do these systems respond to the COVID crisis? What are the choices that they make? Are they responding in terms of changing them, the labor policies, their protections for migrants and migration policies, or are they changing in terms of the broader, the broader systems, the broader characteristics of uh, their systems? So I just want to end by saying, I think th this kind of analysis and this kind of debate that we have in mind is obviously related to debates about restrictions of migrants in low-skilled jobs and about exploitation of migrants in low-skilled jobs. But I do think it goes beyond that. So this is not just about saying, um, highlighting that migrants are often exploited and that we need to think much more seriously about what that, that means for migrants themselves. I think that is important. I think it's highlighting what does that mean? What do those conditions also mean for the resilience of the larger system? So I think individual resilience, migrant resilience is obviously related in important ways to systemic resilience. So I think there are clear complementarities here and there could be also trade-offs. Something that is in the interest of systemic resilience might sometimes not be the interest of ind individual workers, especially if we argue that we need to use migration in order to make the system more flexible. But I think that's a very important window of opportunity now to discuss these systems, uh, these, these issues very explicitly now. And again, uh, to, to think whether it is not time to rethink how we assess the impacts of migration and migration policies. Um, if you want to read more about this, as Mari mentioned, we do have a project around all of this. It's called Migres Hub. I'd encourage you to look at our website and, and look at some of the papers there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Martin. I've got uh, quite a few questions coming through, so I'll be able to pose those um, a little bit, a little bit later. Uh, I think um, you know part of uh, bringing together both what Brenda and you have been saying, and then we will turn to Marla to look at a very specific issue in regards to systems and the degree of resilience that has been displayed. Is that we have seen some flexibility within systems, but it goes straight to the heart of policy deliberations and policy responses, because those have been highly variable. So we've seen very, um, quite different degrees of flexibility within um, immigration systems, also in regards to uh, repatriation efforts, also in regard to regularization and the release of um, migrants, for example, from immigration detention, uh, very kind of granular kind of visa processing and visa programming flexibilities and so forth. And so the question really is how do we not just kind of return to, as Brenda mentioned, not just return to what we had before, but understand some of the risks in systems, understand some of the systemic um, areas where we can shift to improve uh, both the, you know, the, the rights of migrants and their underlying um, needs as well as their contributions to societies in order to ensure that we're bolstering systems in the right places. Um, we know that we won't, this is not the last, you know, big pandemic, that's pretty clear and quite a few people have been saying this for a long time, you know, human interactions and environmental issues uh, mean that we will be likely to be facing uh, more zoonotic uh, coronaviruses in the future. So we know that, and there are other challenges, as again, as uh, Brenda highlighted earlier in regards to carbon emissions and a whole range of issues related to technology. So we'll get into that in a moment. But now let's turn to Marla, and thank you again to Martin. But now we'll turn to Marla to really look at um, a very important aspect, uh, always important, but has been highlighted as being extremely important in terms of migrants' rights as well as safeguarding kind of entire systems. And that is the repatriation of migrant workers. I know that it's a 
fast moving area and a fast moving kind of space, Marla. So um, we really appreciate your kind of your paper, but also the update in terms of what's actually happening on the ground at the moment. So thank you very much, Marla. I'll turn to you. I think you're muted for um, inviting me to be part of this forum and I'll try my best. First of all, where is it? One moment. It was here earlier. Okay. Okay, sorry about this. Okay. Is it showing up? Yep, that's great. Thank you. Go from the beginning. All right. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much again. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Brenda and Martin for the very stimulating presentations. I almost forgot about my own part. But uh, as Mary mentioned, uh, the, the presentation that I'll make is based on the experience of the Philippines in repatriating Filipino migrant workers in this time of the pandemic. And, um, I'm grateful for this opportunity because it does give me a chance to update what what uh, what was contained in the policy brief that was written way back in June and was eventually published, I think, late July or August. And indeed, a lot of developments and changes have taken place. And also, I'd like to mention at the very outset that when I wrote that paper, sorry, way back in June, um, there was not yet a lot of discussion about the integration programs and services because they were not yet introduced uh, around the time. It was uh, towards the latter part of June and uh, July uh, when reintegration programs and services uh, began also to take uh, a lot of prominence in the discussions here in the Philippines. So in that paper, uh, what I tried to do was actually um, to, uh, I, I tried to um, examine the repatriation process because that was one of the immediate responses of the Philippine government in extending support to migrant workers located in different destinations. And um, also to examine the challenges that were met, uh, that were encountered in this particular pandemic. Uh, the Philippines, of course, has experienced uh, uh, repatriating and um, providing assistance to migrant workers that had been placed in crisis situations in the past. But of course, there are many things that are very unprecedented about this particular crisis. And uh, also as part of the reflection that Mary, uh, that Mary also challenged us earlier, is also to look at some of the emerging practices. And indeed, there are some silver linings, I think, even in this very difficult situation. So first of all, in terms of updates, let me just uh, provide some data. Uh, the most recently available data that uh, uh, are available now from the different uh, government agencies. And let me start uh, in setting the context by uh, introducing this data coming from the Department of Labor and Employment as of October 23. And um, uh, as of this particular date, close to 500,000 overseas Filipino workers have lost their jobs or were unable to return to work because the workplaces that they were in had stopped operations. So actually this estimate is already, um, an imp not an improvement, but an, this estimate has already been updated from an early, earlier one of 300,000 that uh, the Department of Labor uh, was using in the early part of the repatriation process. Out of the total of uh, this close to 500,000 OFWs who have been displaced, Already some 260,000 have been repatriated back to the Philippines. Another 131,000 are awaiting repatriation and another 100,000 opted to remain overseas. The third category of workers, uh, Filipino workers who opted to remain overseas, this is not something that is very unusual because even in past crises, there would always be a certain number and share of uh, Filipino migrant workers would choose to stay put and, and just wait out the situation. And uh, even on the deployment side, we also had experience before, experiences before that even in very difficult times, even in times of conflict, people would still choose to go 
um, because they, they think that there's uh, something better uh, up there. So um, again, uh, let me share with you the data coming from the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration, and this is as of October 28, uh, 2020. And as you can see there, there are differences in the numbers uh, concerning how many people have actually been repatriated in the Philippines. I will show you another figure later that is quite different. And part of the differences and part of the discrepancies has something to do with the different definitions of the overseas Filipino population that is covered by these estimates. So I'd like to highlight the numbers that are um, presented in the first half of the slide. Um, and that is the number that suggests that already uh, as of October 28, some 275,000 overseas Filipino migrant, overseas Filipino, Filipino workers have returned to their home regions. Okay, so that's uh, that, that that's quite a very substantial number because normally under normal circumstances, when we think of return migration uh, in non-pandemic uh, in non-pandemic times, uh, the numbers are much less. No? And in fact, this whole idea of uh, how many have actually returned to the Philippines, even under normal circumstances, that's the kind of information that we still continue to um, to look into. Okay, so um, let me just also share with you this data coming from the Department of Foreign Affairs, and this is as of November 8th. Okay, and as you can see, the figure there is a bit lower, uh, but what they are both, uh, uh, what they both share, what they are both consistent in is that uh, when we have to categorize the overseas Filipino workers who have returned, of course, there's a larger share of the land-based migrant workers compared to the sea-based migrant workers. In the early part of the repatriation process, up to about the early part of June, there were more sea-based workers who were repatriated compared to the land-based workers. And that particular profile reflected uh, the closure of uh, cruise ship uh, liners, uh, which employ uh, a large number of Filipino workers. But of course, after that, then uh, what we are seeing now is really a reflection of the real proportion of land-based to sea-based workers. All right. And then in terms of the COVID-19 cases among Filipinos abroad, there are some 11,000 uh, total confirmed cases. And out of the total, uh, some 7,456 have already recovered and were discharged. And the number of deaths have reached 828. And this is data coming from 81 countries for which reports are available. Let me turn now to the repatriation framework and policies of the Philippines. Uh, as Brenda mentioned in her presentation, uh, the dominant form of uh, migration in the region is temporary labor migration. And uh, because of that, this idea of return to the of, of uh, migrant workers returning to their countries of origin is something that is given and is something that is structural. So in, in the Philippines, the governance of temporary labor migration is structured, therefore, around three major phases. Okay, so before migration. So what are the programs and services that are provided to workers before they leave for overseas employment? Uh, the second phase would be the on-site programs and services. Um, what are the programs and services that are provided to OFWs while they are abroad? And the final one is, of course, upon their return to the Philippines. Now, this three-phase um, governance of labor migration is very much um, reflected in the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act of 1995, which is like, the first law um, in the Asian region, particularly in countries of origin, which has as a specific purpose the purpose of promoting the rights and protection of uh, Filipino migrant workers and other overseas Filipinos. So this particular law was amended in, one, in, in uh, 2010, uh, known as the Republic Act RA 122. Okay? So uh, the Philippines has uh, established, um, as a fairly well-established framework of, and, and policies uh, concerning return migration. And under return migration, there's also the anticipation that there would be emergency types or crisis types of return. Um, and, and this is also something that has been born out of the experience, uh, out of the country's experience of more than four decades of uh, um, massive uh, labor migration. And so actually the 
if you, if you would uh, take a look at the dates, uh, the migrant workers and overseas Filipinos Act of 1995 came four years later after the Gulf War of 1991. So the particular experience that we had in the Gulf War of 1990-1991, uh, which required the Philippine government to provide uh, protection to overseas Filipino workers in the Middle East, which hosts the largest concentration of Filipino migrant workers. This has informed um, the practices and the policies, as well as the designation of uh, institutions in the Philippines on how to address uh, crisis situation, how to um, how to develop preparedness and also responsiveness um, when these difficult situations come up. So among the lessons that we learned from that particular experience is the need for Philippine foreign missions to act as one, to, to, to act as one coordinated body, and also the importance of a contingency plan, okay? not only on the part of the Philippine embassies and Philippine consulates, but also in requiring foreign employers, particularly those uh, companies that hire large numbers of Filipino workers. And our experience also in the Gulf War of 1990, 1991, also highlighted and showed to us the role of Filipino communities as partners you know, uh, in these very difficult times. So these experiences have really uh, informed uh, uh, the, 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 the law, uh, the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act, as well as policies and practices that came later. That's why in the law, uh, there are specific provisions no? um, in anticipation of uh, emergency types of repatriation. And uh, specifically, this concern the following. The first one is designating the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration or OWA as the agency that is responsible for repatriation that it will be coordinating with the Department of Foreign Affairs. There's also the provision of uh, having an emergency repatriation fund. Um, and this was increased later under the amended RA-122. And the Quan country team approach, which proved very useful during the Gulf War of 1990-91, that is also part of the law. Um, from around 2011 um, onwards, there were further developments. No? Uh, there were other policies and practices that also came up because also other challenges came up along the way as well. There was the war in Libya, there was the war in Syria, there were the health scares, uh, Verskov and, and so forth. And so this led to other, um, other uh, elaboration no? of uh, what has been in place for some time. So, uh, as I mentioned, the standard, one of the standard operating practices is to require uh, employers, foreign employers of uh, uh, Filipino workers to have an evacuation plan. And this is one of the, this is one of the requirements that they have to submit for their, um, for their request for Filipino workers to be approved. And then the Philippines also de developed the four-level alert system. Okay? When something happens, when there's a crisis, uh, whether it is a natural disaster or a conflict related type of situation it does not necessarily mean uh, it does not necessarily mean that there will be mandatory repatriation so the first level of the four level alert system is simply to um, encourage filipino communities to um, to be mindful of their circumstances and of the and of the developments and it is only uh, at alert level number 4 that there's going to be mandatory repatriation to be undertaken by the philippine government and over the years uh, this idea that the repatriation process will also have to integrate other programs and services have also um, have also um, been reflected in other developments, like in the Assist Well program, which uh, sees an integrated approach to repatriation by incorporating welfare, employment, legal, and livelihood services as well. And then also over the years, especially around 2014, 2015, and 2016, uh, several government agencies, mostly those that are the migration-related agencies, have uh, formulated joint manual of operations uh, whether in terms of uh, providing assistance to migrant workers and overseas Filipinos or in terms of uh, medical repatriation so that there will be a coordinated uh, approach to the, to, the, to the challenges that come up. Uh, during this pandemic, of course, the repatriation process was made a lot more difficult uh, 
uh, due to various factors. No? Uh, in fact, um, the population of, of overseas Filipino workers that the Philippine government has to attend to um, has to be um, uh, has to be uh, subcategorized into various groups. No? You, will have, you have the situation of stranded workers. You have the situation of workers who have been displaced. You also have the situation of stranded workers in the Philippines. Uh, and this would include workers who just came home for a vacation, but were unable to return or to resume their work overseas because of uh, limited international flights. And of course, um, the whole process was also very much affected by the various travel restrictions that were put in place by different countries um, uh, around March, beginning around March. And not only that, uh, the travel restrictions also applied internally as well. So the transfer of repatriated uh, Filipino workers from Manila to their hometowns and to their home provinces and home communities also posed uh, one, of, uh, one of the major challenges, particularly early on uh, in the repatriation experience. So um, uh, um, what the pandemic required, therefore, it really called for a whole of government approach. So. Um, in previous crises, it was largely the migration related agencies that were working together. But this time, um, the migration agencies had to work with other agencies that they did not have a working relationship with before. Okay, So at the top of uh, the whole situation is the so-called interagency task force on emerging infectious diseases. So this was activated early on. And this is actually um, a body that was established in an executive order way back in 2014 because of the various health scares that we experienced, not only here in the Philippines, but also globally. So the intent was really uh, on how to monitor as well as how to contain the spread of um, epidemics, you know, um, particularly in the Philippines. Um, so the repatriation efforts as well as assistance that uh, were provided to OFWs required coordination and synergies with different institutions. And so just to mention a few, you know, for example, uh, in the past, uh, when there was a repatriation process, uh, government agencies like the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration did not have to deal with the Bureau of Fire Protection. They did not have to deal with the uh, armed forces of the Philippines, but because of the many processes that are involved, you know, uh, beginning with the arrival of OFWs, to the swab testing and then to um, transporting them to different um, uh, transporting them to different hotels and accommodations in Metro Manila. All of these details have to be figured out, and they have to be coordinated with these other agencies as well. Um, the assistance that was provided, uh, we, we can we can probably uh, divide them into. Two major parts. The first one is the immediate assistance, and this consisted of a one-time cash assistance of two hundred dollars, or about the equivalent of ten thousand pesos, to affected OFWs on site, those based abroad, and to those who had been repatriated. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, earlier the repatriation of OFWs was also part of the immediate assistance, but it is also an ongoing process. And in this regard, in terms of the, the repatriation assistance provided of OFWs, uh, this consisted, uh, the, the, key, the key elements would consist of the following. Organizing chartered flights, particularly in selected destinations, uh, a whole array of airport assistance upon the arrivals of overseas Filipino workers, free COVID-19 testing, assistance during quarantine, so while they were doing the 14-day quarantine, particularly uh, in the first uh, three or four months, uh, the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration shouldered the hotel accommodations, as well as in providing them with food packs and hygiene packs as well. And also part of the services that were provided during the quarantine period uh, were health services as well as counseling services, because there are, uh, of course, uh, various uh, instances when returning and repatriated overseas Philippine workers um, had um, psychological issues to deal with. And what I'd also like to mention about the repatriation uh, assistance in the Philippines is that it also applied to the repatriation of human remains. You know? Actually, this last one um, 
This came up in June, and this is in response also to the requests of many of, of many families that they would like to have uh, the human remains of their loved ones repatriated to the Philippines so that they could uh, say a proper goodbye to, to their family members. Um, what is interesting, uh, what is important to highlight also is that around the latter part of June and starting from around July, uh, we already see the introduction of various reintegration support and assistance specifically uh, tailored for those who had returned from the pandemic. So, for example, the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration, they already have existing reintegration programs and services uh, under non-pandemic times. But during this pandemic period, they also developed additional uh, support programs. Uh, just to cite one example, um, in addition to the scholarship programs that they normally offer, uh, in normal times, uh, they introduce what is known as Project Ease. No? So it's actually a one-time uh, educational assistance that is provided to um, the children of OFWs, uh, college age children of OFWs, so that they can continue with their studies. And then uh, I think what is very significant to note here is that other government agencies also develop programs uh, that, uh, that are focused on helping repatriated OFWs. So just to cite one example, uh, the Department of Agriculture they uh, offered uh, easy long-term programs for OFWs who have been repatriated. And also the Department of Trade and Industry offered easy long-term programs as well. So uh, in a sense, this also addresses one of the needs that were expressed by repatriated OFWs that um, to the extent possible, they would also like to have assistance in terms of having capital so that they can start uh, a business uh, when, um, for, for their reintegration process. So I just like to end with a few uh, emerging good practices, what I see as some of the silver linings. Uh, I think um, I had also already mentioned that the whole of government approach has been very evident in this pandemic. And uh, hopefully this whole of government approach will also continue even in the post pandemic times, you know, hopefully. Uh, and actually we could also expand this to um, suggest that it's not only the whole of government approach, but really a whole of society approach that would also uh, have spaces for the contributions and participation of non-government actors and institutions like civil society organizations, and of course, the participation of migrants themselves. Um, a very important silver lining is really the adoption of ICT solutions. In a way, the pandemic probably has forced uh, a number of government agencies to adopt technological solutions to some of the problems that we have, uh, uh, the, the challenges that we encountered during this pandemic. So there was um, uh, virtually uh, all government agencies uh, in the migration family, they uh, um, started using online platforms and social media to provide uh, information, um, particularly information and also um, other, other, the delivery of, of other programs like counseling to uh, affected OFWs and their families. A very important development is uh, the introduction of OASIS. So this is the OFW assistance information system that was introduced by the Department of Labor and Employment in June of this year. And what this, uh, what, what, what this does is really to provide a more integrated uh, database so that from the time that the OFWs register while they are still in the countries of destination, to the time that they arrive here in the Philippines, uh, information on their arrival, information on their needs, where they will be billeted and so forth, can be gathered. And I see this as something that uh, has the potential also of uh, uh, being a good database so that later on, uh, other reintegration programs and services can be fine-tuned. So it's possible to have, uh, to return to this database uh, and to use this um, in order to follow up what has happened to, to the repatriated OFWs, as well as to offer them um, more streamlined programs and services. And also part of the social media presence is uh, having, uh, is organizing town hall meetings in online forms uh, so that they're able to reach OFWs in different destinations. And I would also like to say that it's not only the government agencies that are using them, but also NGOs and also migrants are using them to air their concerns, their grievances, as well as uh, their expressions of uh, 
tanks uh, when their needs are addressed. Uh, what we have seen so far is that uh, it seems that when it comes to repatriation um, um, processes, a lot of this is really undertaken by countries of origin like the Philippines. And also thinking a little bit beyond, it would be good to also consider a beyond national approach you know, to the challenges posed by the pandemic. I'm also quite happy to note that very recently um, in the in a meeting that we just had uh, last week, uh, it's good to find out that in the 13th ASEAN Forum on Migrant Labor, there is actually a specific topic that is devoted to addressing uh, the issues on how to support migrant workers in this time of the pandemic. And it is something that will be discussed by the ASEAN as a community. Uh, but I think it's also important to consider pandemic scenarios in some of the existing tools that we have. And one of them is the MICIC initiative, uh, which has uh, which published the guidelines to protect migrants in countries experiencing conflict or, dis or natural disaster. So I think it would be important to um, also um, consider uh, what could happen and um, um, and 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 um, just be sensitive, uh, and especially because we have already our experience now. Uh, perhaps it could also inform um, future future editions of uh, of the guidelines to take pandemic situations into account. And of course, I'm also very hopeful that the issue of uh, uh, the post pandemic um, migration scenarios would be discussed in. The global compact for migration as well as in the global compact for refugees and i end with that thank you thank you very much uh, indeed marla for that very kind of detailed and um, comprehensive as well historical um run through in terms of uh, the philippines response both to the pandemic and and where it came from and i think it highlights your presentation highlights you know points um, made both by martin and brenda uh, one in particular comes to mind, and that is in terms of, you know, successfully resilient sort of systems, learning, um, adapting, and the flexibility is particularly important. And you've really demonstrated that in the Philippines context that has been, that capability has been built over a number of years from other crises and then has been built upon even in real time during this pandemic, which was great to see. Um, nice that you ended actually on the GCM because we do have a question for all panelists um, in regards to what I would package, because we've got several questions there, but what I would package as kind of multilateral um, uh, agreements and even treaties. So uh, you mentioned, for example, the MICIC um, initiative that was a state-led process uh, finalised uh, in 2016 and the guidelines uh, released. It was in response to what I would call a more localized um, crisis event, and that was particularly 2011 Libya. But of course, it um, has much wider applicability. In some respects, um, even though it has fantastic guidelines and good ideas for response and preparedness, has been a little bit like many systems and many initiatives overwhelmed by the sheer scale of what we're dealing with in yeah. COVID-19. So we sort of have to keep that in mind. But the questions that I've got coming through from our attendees really go to how do you think this pandemic will impact and affect both the implementation of the global compact uh, for safe orderly regular migration and uh, the GCR, the global compact uh, on refugees, as well as we've got one question in relation to the Migrant Worker Convention. So keep that in mind too. And I would also, even though it hasn't come up as a question, just highlight your point, Marla, in regard to ASEAN and how ASEAN is taking on this issue in the context of the deliberation. So we're not just looking really at the global level, we are looking at regional um, forums, we're looking at uh, RCPs as well. So I will hand over first to Brenda, and then if we can go to Martin and to Marla, thanks. I mean, those are such wide ranging questions and one doesn't really know where to start. I guess um, if I start at a sort of more fundamental level, in a sense, temporary migrants are nobody's child. I mean, uh, in a, they, they are, they, 
in, in the politics of migration and, and labour and with the growing sort of economic nationalism that we see around the world, um, they really have uh, very few people people or, or stakeholders who are interested in their welfare, right? So um, what I do see is that uh, this particular pandemic basically offers us an, a, a window opportunity, as, as already been said, because things cannot really go on as before. And why, why not? Um, to me, the most fundamental issue is that cheap and easy transnational mobility is no longer possible. You can't assume that anymore. And temporary migration schemes and movements of, of people, I mean, it's very much predicated on that. So, um, so it is in the interest of uh, nation states, as well as migrants to rethink how to deal with uh, migrant labour issues in an uh, era of stalled mobility or low mobility, right? I mean, uh, and um, to, in a sense, uh, think about where the various global or regional compacts and alliances can go. I think there needs to be a, a fresh rethink. I mean, um, we more or less needs to go back to the drawing boards to, in a sense, rethink what it's going to be like, because one of the most fundamental assumptions to do with transnational mobility is no longer something that we can depend on. I mean, I, I, I think others might have more specific things to say, but uh, um, that's, that's my sense that, um, I mean, in ASEAN, for example, there's all, all been discussions about how to, in, in a sense, improve transnational skilled mobility across borders. That's been an issue. Uh, and uh, But um, that's not going to be, in a sense, uh, as feasible in a time of uh, stalled mobility. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass on to, to Martin or, or, or Mala. Uh, Mike Mala. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I will also try. Uh, I think um, actually yes. Uh, let me let me just um, build on what Brenda has mentioned earlier. Uh, Brenda's point that uh, cheap and easy uh, labor migration can't uh, go on much longer and shouldn't go on much longer. Uh, actually, my fear is that. Uh, um, I, 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 I think migration is really going to be costly, uh, and I base that on what I see, for example, here in the Philippines, the on the ground realities. You know, like migrants are have to well, when they apply for work and then before they leave for their countries of destination, they have to go through a series of swap testing. Okay? And while there are guidelines on who should be paying what, uh, what uh, on the ground realities also tell us is that for the most part these costs are also passed on to migrants. And actually, that's one of my personal concerns that when migration becomes very costly, I'm just, uh, I'm just afraid that the costs will not necessarily be borne by the employers, the costs will not necessarily be borne by the private recruitment agencies, but it will simply be passed on to migrants. And so, um, in, in this sense, I think uh, that, that's why I'm I'm sort of thinking that we, we really need to have a, a discussion on this you know, because uh, uh, if it's going to be costly and if uh, health screening and health surveillance is also going to be part of migration policies uh, and there are costs that are involved, how are these responsibilities going to be distributed and who uh, shoulders what? You know? So. Um, I, I'm hoping my, my, my mention about the global compact uh, for migration and also the global compact on refugees, uh, I think I was expressing also more of an aspirational idea, uh, because in a sense, I think it's also really quite challenging um, to, to discuss uh, the many, many issues that have to be, uh, that have to be figured out and threshed out. But nonetheless, uh, perhaps one, one, one step no, is that uh, maybe it would, be, it would be useful if uh, the GCM or if the GCR could hold a special, um, special meeting 
special forum, specifically also on the pandemic. Uh, our experience here in the region is that actually there had been a regional review of the implementation of the GCM, but it's like um, the pandemic has been put in a, you know, um, like just a, a it, it's, it's acknowledged that it is happening, but then it would require a different um, a different discussion. So, so I think it's time to um, it, it, it would be useful to, to organize uh, a GCM that's very focused on this particular issue because there are many things that uh, countries of origin, countries of transit, and countries of destination have to figure out. Uh, ASEAN. Um, I, I, I think there are small steps that are being undertaken. Um, I'm quite uh, I'm, I'm quite encouraged that uh, the 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 ongoing uh, ASEAN forum on migrant labor um, is paying attention to the issue of uh, supporting migrant workers in the time of the pandemic. Um, but of course, I'm I'm also quite realistic. I know that. Um, most of the discussions will also be more, um, will be less binding. So on the one hand, yes, there are small steps towards it, but uh, we also need to have more binding, binding uh, agreements you know, to move to and to commit. To. Thank you, Marla. I'll hand over to Martin. And also, um, Martin, I've got a couple of questions through for you, which do, do go to this issue. Um, particularly uh, in terms of your presentation, how that actually the use of multilateral forums can assist or can actually create tensions when you're looking at those global supply chains and the transnational kind of approach that you outlined in your presentation. So a slight nuance, I think, to the to the more general question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> On the global compact, I mean, one thing that the global com compact does is is to kind of highlight certain uh, frameworks for, for certain processes, how we think about labor migration, and, and it sets out certain goals. And of course, one of the things it does say is that, you know, countries should, should, should think about the need for migrant workers also at, at different skill levels. And of course, in a way, the, the response immediately is, well, yes, we agree that we need to do that, but how? And, and there, has been, there has been a lot of debate, uh, certainly in, in high income countries, about how you do needs tests and how, how you do these things. So I think similarly, uh, I think in the implementation of the Global Compact, I think there could be an important role for um, uh, there could be, it could be very important to bring this issue of systemic resilience just onto the table and say, look, when you think about labor migration, is this now an additional consideration that actually opens the door for doing things a little bit differently? And, and if you say, okay, we all, let, let's assume we agree that migrants can play a role in affecting systemic resilience. What does that mean for policymaking? So to kind of put, put in place a certain framework for thinking about things in a structured way, just to give you an example. Um, so we could say, well, you know, we could have a policy that's strategic, that is strategic, a migration policy that provides easier access for migrants to particular types of sectors, because we think that these are of strategic importance, for example, because they're essential sectors. One question immediately is, well, how do you pick those sectors? I mean, some sectors will be straightforward, health, care, but there'll be lots of other employers who will want to come in and say, our, our jobs are strategic too. Our jobs are essential. So I think it would be very helpful to have a common framework for how you think about these things, just like we've, we're beginning to have a framework for how we think about shortages and immigration policy responses. And I think an international forum can play a role in that. And similarly, the whole debate about migrant rights and migrant rights protections and, uh, you know, what's in the global compact about, um, you know, letting migrants change employers and all of that, the consequences of that. I think what the focus on resilience does is, is, is shine a light on the consequences of some of these restrictions of individual rights for larger issues such as resilience. But these issues are of direct importance to host communities. So therefore, I think there's a chance that politically they might be taken uh, seriously. So I think, again, Global Compact in my view, should 
pick up or the implementation should pick up some of those 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 issues um but i think it could be quite productive to do that in terms of you know beginning to think more seriously about lower skilled migrants migrants rights and also linking migration to other policy issues and similar with regard to global supply chains um i mean most countries you know we have an aspiration that we say we have kind of common policy making but in practice many countries very much focus on themselves and their own interests but i think when you know if you take systemic resilience seriously it, do, it does make you think about what's happening in other countries so you know again if you rely on medical gloves imports from malaysia being produced mainly using migrant workers then you know suddenly other countries also european countries will take an interest in i don't know employment conditions of migrants producing medical gloves in malaysia that are then being imported so again i think this i mean this might be naive but i do think that uh, politically there might be a change because it changes some of the equations for some of the host countries the rich host countries that maybe in the past used to very much focus on their own interests in policy making and saying look if we're interested in in resilience of some of these services we do need to think much more carefully about what's happening in other countries and about working together with some of these other countries and again a global forum like the gcm could be a very good venue for having some of these conversations Yes, thanks, Martin. And we certainly are. We are seeing that um, to some degree. We've got a few questions coming through in regards to how the pandemic has really highlighted in a very sort of clear way some of the global inequalities. And here we're talking about not just between uh, states, which of course um, is an issue, but also the inequalities within societies. And as um, I think all speakers have mentioned, the essential uh, um, workers, many of whom in certain sectors and in certain countries are migrant workers, and some are even undocumented uh, migrant workers who have uh, no recourse to any social protection mechanisms, but they are nevertheless still performing some essential tasks in societies who are in crisis. So we've got these sort of conundrums and these contradictions and quite a few sort of uh, policy and operational sort of tensions. I wanted to quickly go back and I am very aware that we're way over time and I also have a lot of questions in the, in, um, in the chat coming through, but I really wanted to go back to something that I highlighted earlier and uh, ask all the panelists to really provide their reflections on the gender dimensions because again it is something that we are seeing being highlighted in terms of a long-term issue that has been built up over a number of uh, years and is being really being highlighted in terms of the the impacts that it can be quite different in different environments and different sectors so reflections on what it's really shown us but also what it shows we need to be doing better in terms of recovering and and having responses uh coming through and there was quite a few questions related uh to which is central to any discussion on um labor migration systems is international remittances and as we know we've seen the projected decline of international remittances that has been revised by the world bank um, to be not so bleak but also we have seen uh, not just changes in remittances and remittance patterns and declines but we've seen the shift from informal remittance channels to formal remittance channels uh, including through the use of expanded ICT services and, and so forth. So if I can leave those uh, two questions for you in terms of some of your insights in terms of what you've been seeing and your analysis in those two areas and also what that might mean for future systems and future partnerships and collaborations. So I'll go to Brenda first. Thanks. Uh, again, so many interesting questions. I mean, and uh, so little time to discuss, but um, I guess let me let me sort of uh, take the, the gender question uh, because uh, I have been working on uh, migrant domestic workers for quite some time now, and what what we do see, uh, which is not surprising, is that uh, in terms of the pandemic, it affects uh, men and women quite differently because for many of the migrant. Uh, women who are migrant workers work in the care sector or in the domestic sphere and immobility of lockdowns basically mean that um, they are often um, 
further immobilized uh, as opposed to just in, in a sense being sort of uh, sequestered within the nation state as stranded migrants. They're also further sort of immobilized within the home space. And um, this has been associated with increasing levels of domestic violence. I mean, uh, as sort of everybody sort of uh, gets into each other's way uh, within home space. So um, that, that has been, I think, an issue that uh, is of growing concern uh, and um, we need to think about uh, the way that we think about um, domestic work and um, so I mean personally I mean being in a sense confined to, to home space uh, with children and so forth I mean uh, um, means that uh, your sense of a self and space really needs sort of extension and it basically makes me uh, more empathetic to people who have to in a sense work at home women who have to work at home uh, as their space of work so it has no separation of 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 uh 24 7 of of work and home so uh these are some issues that i think uh do require further attention what can we do about it? <laughs> uh, maybe I'll pass on to the others for their comments first. Yeah. Thanks, Brenda. Um, over to you, Marla. Yes. Um, you know, in the previous crisis, um, we learned, uh, particularly in the in our experience experience here in Asia, that domestic work is one of the sheltered uh, sectors. Uh, in the previous crisis, of course, there were economic crises. They were not, it was not a pandemic, but nonetheless, uh, we did not see a lot of displacement of domestic workers, uh, which at the time, I think one of the lessons learned that I remember is that, uh, that, 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 that tells us that domestic work, care work is very important because it's uh, whether we're talking about good or bad times, uh, um, whatever happens with our economies, then, you know, care work is something that has to be done. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, it's a relatively sheltered uh, type of work. But of course, even then, our concerns were, and uh, it also applies to our concerns now, is that uh, under what conditions are they working? Yes, they may not be losing their jobs. They, are, they may not be displaced. They may not be among the large numbers of people who are repatriated to their home countries. But what are the conditions of work? That they experienced you know, during this pandemic. So, um, in, in that regard, I think in countries of destination, um, uh, there also has to be uh, a lot more attention and also a lot more sensitivity to uh, the conditions of work of uh, migrant workers who are still very much around. Um, what we are seeing now, I think there's also some kind of an intersection with the, the sector of work that people are in. Okay? So, for instance, um, uh, in, in the case of, the, uh, and I'm speaking, for example, uh, uh, taking the Philippines as an example, um, generally deployment levels are very down, okay, for most types of work except for healthcare. And in fact, that's a rather controversial uh, uh, policy issue in the Philippines at the moment. Uh, and um, the, other, the other sector that's um, where there's some level of deployment and, and, and demand is the case of uh, um, seafarers on merchant vessels. Okay. Um, when we talk about the sea-based sector, um, in the past, you know, the sea-based sector in the Philippines was uh, very much driven by the rise in the demand for cruise ship personnel. And it, was, uh, it, it is a sector that had a lot of women. But because the cruise ship industry is very down, Okay, so we see a lot of women in the sea-based sector losing their job. So I think we also have to uh, recognize uh, gender in relation also to other variables like the sector of the economy that they're working in. Because now at the moment, one of the so-called so uh, bright areas or positive uh, uh, bright areas in the sense that there is some um, demand for, for Filipino workers is actually in the sector of uh, um, seafair, uh, people working in the sea-based sector uh, that are employed 
in uh, foreign vessels. And um, we know also that this is one sector that has been recognized by the International Labor Organization and also by the international community as essential workers. And uh, I guess I'd also like to cite this as an example of how the, the global community came together you know, to allow for some lifting of travel restrictions so that there would be, an, um, so that uh, seafarers could be allowed to work and to change crew change crews uh, because it's something that's very essential to their to, to their well-being as well um yeah um i in terms of the repatriation uh, experience and reintegration experience i think that's one thing that uh, uh, would be good to research would be a very good research topic what happens to uh, men and women who have returned to their home countries um, and uh, whether there are any gender differences in how they are able to access supports and programs and services, and um, also how they are able or not able to rebuild their lives once they are back in their home country. So I think um, I don't have a clear answer to that, but I think it's one research question that can be explored further. Excellent, thank you very much, Marlon. Couldn't agree more. Um, also in terms of um, uh, the Second question that I asked in regards to remittances, I would say the same thing because we have seen different sort of gender dimensions occurring in regards to remittance um, receipts, people who are in destination countries, and also the use of remittances in origin countries along gender lines. I will now hand over to Martin. I'm conscious that we are now within the kind of like the 90 minute um, zone. We've just crossed over that. Uh, we do still have quite a few people online so i will ask the panelists if we finish this question and i'll let martin speak in a moment i will then just do one more quick round in case there are some burning issues that you really want to add to the discussion and to the webinar um so first over to martin and then i can go back to and marla thanks yeah thanks i'll just uh, tr I'll try to be brief a small addition on the point of inequality which is an important one now of course what we see now, the pandemic has shone a light on inequality within countries, but I think importantly, it's, it's also raised the, the question of, you know, what do we really value in our society? So it, ra it raises quite a big question about work and the future of work. Um, we, we talk about essential workers and we see that a lot of them are poorly paid and work in very precarious employment conditions. So, you know, we see a lot of praise, a lot of clapping, but obviously the question is, well, you know, what about paying them more or, or, or you know, raising the appreciation of the level, the, the social worth that we typically assign to this kind of work. And there's a lot of unpaid work done in, in, in the household, which is now incredibly important uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, what we also need is a real rethink about you know, what are the important job? What is important work? What is socially important? And how does it need to be remunerated? Uh, you know, uh, what kind of pay does need to go along with that? And this debate is not only about migrants, but about all workers, of course. So it's not only about migrants doing essential work, but about all workers. And in some cases, you know, when we think about resilience, the answer might be, well, yes, there should be more protections for migrants and there should be more open immigration policies but there might also be other um, cases where a strengthening of an employment condition say through for example also mechanization might actually lead to less to fewer workers being employed and then also to potentially less migration or uh, uh, less employment of migrant workers in particular taught jobs that is also possible but the point i'm trying to make is that this is really about all workers and about migrants and, and I think this debate about what's important in society more generally is really important now. Thank you very much, Martin. Couldn't agree more. Um, it certainly came up in, uh, in the conference earlier this week that uh, EUI held. Now, uh, last words, Brenda, I'll hand over to you just to see if you have any kind of burning issues or comments that you'd like to make. Um. I, I think I just have one one comment. I mean, um, the the pandemic has really shone a light on uh, issues that uh, we in the past could, in a sense, sweep under the carpet of economic nationalism and ignore them. And it's also provoked many divergent views. So, I guess to end on a more optimistic note, I think there is a groundswell of empathy and and care and awareness. 
uh, of the essential role of uh, migrant workers alongside the xenophobia, the racism, and so forth. I mean, um, uh, I'm in a sense very taken by the fact that the term essential worker has come into currency. It is part of the vocabulary and, um, and it's quite an elastic category. I mean, healthcare workers, of course, agricultural workers, but also sort of includes the cleaners. You know, I mean, as people become more aware that uh, these are essential services that uh, uh, happens underground uh, in the in the migrant dominated economy that um, citizens are not uh, so aware of. So again, to be optimistic, I think there is this groundswell of 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 of, of empathy and awareness that we can tap on uh, and use as a energizing moment, a galvanizing moment uh, to move forward to more sustainable systems. Yeah, I will just stop there. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Nice note uh, for you to end on there too. Marla, just wanted to see if you wanted to say any last words. Um, uh, for my part, I, I would just like to share, uh, I guess, two questions that I have for myself. And also, I think uh, I'd like to share with everybody, uh, like in the in the in the experience of the Philippines, one question that has uh, crossed my mind is that could this be the end of labor migration, and could this be uh, something? Uh, and could this experience really force us and compel us to uh, look for solutions and look for other stra for, for strategies other than uh, labor migration, as uh, in terms of uh, our development pathway and also in terms of generating uh, employment prospects. But the other question that uh, was also um, that was also um, that, that also crossed my mind uh, based on Brenda's presentation is um, could could this pandemic also point us to the way that uh, perhaps it is also time for countries of destination to consider a pathway for residents? So I'll end with that. Great, thank you very much. I can see too webinar titles out of those. <laughs> Very good questions. Uh, we could spend probably a whole workshop actually just on each, um, as we know, especially in regards to, we didn't even get to it, but the issues in relation to technology and automation, which Brenda, of course, raised. And we are seeing this in certain sectors, um, which to me raises a whole range of other kind of like issues and questions, including some of the, the arguments that are put forward for, you know, further automation in the agricultural uh, sector is the, um, discussion about how, uh, you know, machines can't get viruses. Well, well, actually, <laughs> we've seen a rise in, you know, cybercrime and, and machines can get viruses and they can be very uh, damaging as well. Uh, to Martin, last word, Martin, I just want to offer you the floor in case there are some uh, final comments that you would like to make. Uh, no, just well, just to thank you again for organising this, because I suppose a fundamental question when we think about COVID and migration is, and, and how we deal with it is, is are we treating it as an issue that's, that we put in a box and that's kind of sitting on the side and then everything else that we were doing before just continues? Or are we moving it to the center and, and kind of recognize that actually no, even you know, when we have vaccines, we're not just gonna go back to, to normal. And, and I suppose I'm one of those who says that we should really think, move it to the center. And e even for initiatives like the Global Compact, it's it's, probably not going to be business as usual going forward. I think there are really some fundamental structural questions that need to be asked about all these things, um, even when when the kind of immediate emergency declines now. So so I think this is really very good that IOM and, and you guys are, are, are encouraging this kind of discussion. Thank you very much, Martin. And that is the fantastic kind of segue to really mention the papers that all uh, three panelists have actually written and, and we've published in uh, recent weeks and months and that goes to the transformation of migration and mobility and we are really looking at how the pandemic is uh, likely to or we want to help reshape aspects uh, the negative aspects in regards to um, migration and mobility going forward what it also shows i think today's discussion um, has been super um, interesting but it's also showing how even those papers, as Marla's um, mentioned very clearly, but also relates to Brenda's and also to yours too, Martin, is that we need to be keeping a watching brief on this. So we will be coming back to our high level advisors on migration research to engage further on the topic, to assess uh, 
what the current situation is, how we've seen um, uh, policies evolve, how we've seen operational responses uh, evolve, and what that then means for uh, the future of migration and mobility in, um, in the years to come. I think the second wave has highlighted um, you know, this, the severity of the kind of the shock. We're out of the first acute phase, but we're still not even 12 months really into, um, into the pandemic. And we know that uh, notwithstanding the vaccine, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, coming, coming through soon, that there will be long-term systemic um, challenges that we will need to be uh, facing together. So thank you again, and thank you to our attendees, our resilient <laughs> attendees who um, engaged, came back online, uh, joined the discussion. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the questions, but I did try and cover the main uh, issues that were coming through in multiple questions. And we look forward to um, seeing you online for the next webinar. Thank you again so much.